Thank you very much, Miles, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the, the day's events. I'm not an expert in redistricting like most of the people in this room, so I'm looking forward to learning a huge amount. I'm a political philosopher by training, and uh, one of the interesting things about being at the Kennedy School is encountering people who are actually doing the work on the ground. And the, there's a moral, redistricting is a point at which our political ethics and practical politics really clash, right? So as we'll talk about throughout the day, political parties have a strong incentive to redistrict maps in their favor for partisan advantage. But, if the, and, but we think as citizens, as outside observers, as people thinking about political ethics and democracy, well, that's wrong. They shouldn't rig the rules of the game. So one of the central tensions in my mind in the redistricting puzzle is, look, you can either be moral and good in your politics, or you can be a sucker. And in this environment, it's very, very difficult to reconcile those two things. And so I think a bunch of people who are speaking today will have different positions on whether uh, it's worse to be a sucker than to be immoral. But that is the challenge that redistricting poses for us. Redistricting is uh, as old as uh, George Washington allegedly chopping down the cherry tree. And so uh, Miles and his design for this conference uh, has uh, kind of really brilliantly designed a uh, look at the past, a look at the present, and a look at the future. That's a, the temporal arc of the meeting. And we have no better person today to talk to us about the history of redistricting than uh, my good friend and colleague, Alex Kazar. Alex is the Matthew W. Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy. He is uh, a, perhaps, the leading historian of democracy in the United States, uh, who has also written about other issues, such as labor and technology, his great book, The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, was named the best book in U.S. history by both the American Historical Association and the Historical Society in the year that it was published. It was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the Los Angeles Times Book Award. He's currently working on a book on the history of the Electoral College titled, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? that will be out in less than a year. That topic has taken on renewed interest in light of the 2016 presidential election when many of my friends really ask, who actually won that? Well, it depends on what the benchmark is, I suppose. And uh, right now, the benchmark is the Electoral College. He's a frequent contributor and signatory to amicus briefs in cases on the law of democracy, many such cases, including, importantly, Gil V. Whitford. Please welcome Alex Kazar. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and speaking of the Electoral College, it's just a little self-indulgent quip, but some of you may have noticed uh, this morning that the New York Times came out with an enormous editorial uh, in favor of getting rid of the Electoral College. And I'm about to send a note to some of my friends in the New York Times asking why they took the opposite position in the late 1970s when, when it was hanging in the balance and their advocacy meant something. Um, but I welcome them to, I, I, I welcome them, uh, to the cause. Actually, it's sort of a bellwether. They've gone up and down over the last century about the Electoral College. In any case, today we're talking about gerrymandering. And let me start with uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, appropriately enough, in this building. When he was asked, in 1968, as he was on the verge of retirement, he was asked which of the Supreme Court's decisions um, during his leadership of the court was the most important and did he value most. He was unhesitating in his response. He responded that it was the districting and apportionment decisions decided in the early to mid 1960s. Uh, Reynolds versus Sims, Baker versus Carr, and a number of others. It was not the much better known Brown versus Topeka, which ended uh, public school segregation. It was not Gideon versus Wainwright, which gave to criminal defendants the right to counsel. But it was the set of decisions that, that imposed the standard of one person, one vote um, on districting for Congress and for state legislatures. In pointing to those decisions, Warren was underscoring his view, which was amply expressed 
in the decisions themselves that unfair, distorted, and partisan systems of districting posed a grave threat to American democracy. That such systems could and did prevent uh, the people from having the legislatures and policies that they genuinely preferred. Warren was also acknowledging that gerrymandering and malapportionment had deep roots in U.S. history, and that a long historical record made clear that the problem of gerrymandering would not be self-correcting, uh, that an undemocratically chosen legislature could not be counted on to make its electoral procedures more democratic. And that's really the heart of the policy issue uh, that we face. So as we stand again as an important juncture when racial gerrymandering again remains or still remains a vexing problem in the United States, and when partisan gerrymandering has again assumed dangerous proportions despite the standard of one person, one vote, um, and when the Supreme Court obviously is considering whether or not to intervene, uh, a brief foray into the history seems to be in order. I have, uh, I have about another 25 minutes to cover 200 years, so, I'm gonna st so I will do this briskly. Um, so one of the things about being a historian at policy conferences, you always get to speak first thing in the morning and you get usually a half hour to cover all the past, and then, uh, then you get groups of five or six people get two hours to discuss the last 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so it's an occupational hazard for me, but I've grown accustomed to it. So let's start. I mean, that is, the, that is a drawing of the original gerrymander. Um, gerrymandering has been present throughout our nation's history. It's, it's think of it as the creation of legislative districts drawn with the intent of gaining partisan advantage. Um, it can be done either through having districts of, with different population sizes or of unusual shapes or often both. If you can do both, that's really good. You can really get a lot of advantage. It's fitting, if a little bit sad, that this phenomenon is named in honor of Elbridge Gerry, governor of Massachusetts, who is, who is I mean, he is, he is one of the founding fathers of the nation. What, you know, what, what is little known about Elbridge Gerry um, is that he was a signatory of the Declaration of Independence. He was present at the uh, writing of the U.S. Constitution in Philadelphia. He was vice president of the United States on, in James Madison's second term. But all everybody, anybody remembers about Elbridge Gerry is this. Um, and that's, it's, it's a sad fate. Um, the phenomenon of gerrymandering, of course, preceded uh, Elbridge Gerry. Uh, he, was, he, did, he did not invent this. He just happened to come up with a really good version of it that the press took off on. There were colonial precedents uh, in colonial elections. Um, and even in the United States, or very early in the United States, uh, in 1787, Patrick Henry tried to gerrymander James Madison out of a seat in Congress. I mean, this, you know, this is, the gerrymandering was there at the creation. It took both forms of misshapen districts and districts of different sizes. Some of the early malapportionment, or what we would call malapportionment today, uh, was grounded in a desire uh, in many states to have representation in the state legislatures of existing political units. For example, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts uh, House, there would be a, a representative for every town or city. Uh, and that obviously created in our rising kind of population uh, disproportion. The advantage of doing uh, uh, Districting that way was that you didn't have to draw new maps, but then you did have to decide how many representatives uh, went to particular units. The problem of, of gerrymandering starts to become more prevalent in the first party system, which is the Federalists against the Democratic Republicans, um, which really takes off at the, at the end of the 1790s. And then again, and more virulently, in the second party system in the 1830s. And the conflicts over this were so severe that there were states in the 1830s and 1840s which were not able to hold legislative elections because they could not agree on maps. I mean, the, the, the problem was already severe. Um, and it was widespread and rampant, but it was not accepted 
or considered acceptable. That was a point actually that in the amicus brief that a number of historians put forward <coughs> in Gill versus Whitford. Part of our point, the, the uh, our, I was going to say, the, 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 our opponents in the case have argued that, ah, there's something wrong with gerrymandering. It's always been a great, it's always, it's always happened. No, bi no big problem. It's always been acceptable. And we as historians decided to make the case that no, it has not always been acceptable. Um, it has been denounced. It has happened. Uh, but it has been denounced. And you denounce it, of course, especially when somebody else does it. Um, but uh, there was a huge outcry when, about, against Patrick Henry when he tried to gerrymander Madison. Newspapers in the first half of the 19th century denounced gerrymandering laws as, and I'm quoting here, inflicting a grievous wound on the Constitution as resurrecting England's rotten boroughs or as, quote, a deadly poisoned arrow leveled with certain aim at the inestimable right of suffrage. To combat this, some states actually insisted on putting in their constitutions requirements that legislative districts have roughly the same uh, population. Congress also responded to some of these early waves of gerrymandering by passing a law in 1842 requiring that members of Congress be chosen in single member districts. That's not in the Constitution. The single member districts and from districts that were contiguous and compact. Um, they actually, 30 years later, 1872, they passed another law saying uh, that districts should be of equal size. Okay, so Congress does get into the act. The acts of Congress are never enforced. Okay, uh, they, they, they have uh, very little effect. Uh, and in some states before the Civil War, rules, norms are enforced, others not. The problem explodes, really, for the problem of gerrymandering explodes after the Civil War, uh, in the final decades of the 19th century. Uh, especially in the South and the Midwest, but, not, but by no means exclusively there. This is a period of hotly contested national elections combined with, and I think this is important, high rates of immigration um, and urbanization. And also this is a period when African Americans uh, throughout the South are enfranchised for a time and only, only um, temporarily. So you have, the, you, you, there's very rapid social change, very rapid change in the social composition of, of many states, and you get constant political warfare, I mean, really warfare over districting. Uh, you know, this, I mean, it really makes our current battles seem kind of quaint compared to what happened in the late 19th century. In the South, of course, this was done, the gerrymandering that was done was done to weaken the power of the freedmen who had recently been enfranchised, and also to weaken the power of, the Republi of Republicans who still had some strength somewhere, and of the populists uh, later in the 19th century. Uh, let me uh, give it, let me go back to that. Um, and th this is, uh, South Carolina's boa constrictor uh, district from the late 19th century. And if you ever, if you think that packing is a recent phenomenon of the computer era, think again. If you look at District 7 and its unusual shape and you look at these numbers, District 7 was created to have a population that would be 82% African American. Right, okay, basically, uh, and this was not atypical of what was going on uh, in, in the South. In some places like New England, uh, gerrymandering and malapportionment continued in a constitutional form because towns were still represented. Every town had a, repre uh, um, had a representative, but that gave advantages if we, think, if we think as we do now in terms of population, that gave advantages to rural areas over cities, to Protestants over Catholics, uh, and to Republicans over Democrats and radical groups, of which there were many in the late 19th century. 
What you had was a kind of, in, in these areas, including New England, gerrymandering by stasis, by not changing the districting, uh, even though the population was changing. But in, it's in the Midwest that things go really haywire. Uh, the dominant pattern was that Republicans gerrymandered very heavily and very severely to ensure that they remained in power, except on those occasions when Democrats did occasionally win legislative elections, and they retaliated as fiercely and rapidly as they could, always. I mean, it was, it was like a, a knee-jerk um, reaction. Um, packing and cracking were commonplace. In some states, the, the contests over this were very frequent because at the, during this era and during this contested period, redistricting did not just happen after the census, okay? Whenever a new party got control of the, of the legislature, they redistricted. Ohio had six redistrictings between 1878 and 1890, okay? They're doing it all the time, trying to accentuate um, their advantage. Uh, I'm gonna go back here to, this is a, a quote, for, and, and these Republican gerrymanders making it really almost impossible for a Democrat to win. Uh, Garfield, who as you know later became president, uh, you know, also said that, that the districting system was the weak point in the theory of representative government as now organized and, un and, and understood. Um, in Indiana, you know, another sort of uh, uh, an, an important, just one of many examples in the Midwest, but uh, in the 1880s, Democrats got control of the state legislature, which had been predominantly Republican. Um, and they redistricted to guarantee, one of their key strategic goals was to guarantee that they would elect a Democratic senator and remove Benjamin Harrison, who was a Republican senator uh, from office. That, again, this is the time legislatures are choosing senators so that gerrymandering has an added advantage um, at, 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 the, at the state level. Um, and. This is a res one of the responses uh, to this uh, Democratic gerrymander. Uh, the, 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 really, the Democrats did nothing that the Republicans had not been doing for at least a decade, but they were doing it to Republicans, which was really outrageous. Um, and they launched an enormous counterattack. I have to say, there's a whole there's a complicated side dimension to this in the late 19th century, which is that Republicans feel righteous doing whatever gerrymandering they're doing in the North as retaliation for what Democrats are doing in the South. Okay, so that, that's, there's that, there's that dimension um, is feeding this. But in fact, the gerrymandering issue became so severe, the Democrats did manage to uh, defeat uh, Benjamin Harrison. He launched a big political campaign fighting gerrymanders. That became his cause. And he rode that issue to the White House in 1888. I mean, it gives you some sense of how big, how big an issue was. Benjamin Harrison became president because of his opposition to gerrymandering, or at least his opposition to gerrymandering by Democrats. But that's uh, you know, a, a, sl a slightly more cynical view. We should also note, just in terms of the, of the president, that Wisconsin was another state which had chronic gerrymandering problems. Uh, in the late 19th century. In this period, state courts finally overcame some of their reluctance, and they did intervene, okay? They slowly, gradually, they did intervene um, and, and decide that some districting maps were not acceptable. But their interventions were not very effective for several reasons. One is that the pattern was to act only on the basis of the most egregious violations. Um, Second is that the courts themselves were generally elected and often partisan uh, and responded accordingly. And the third was that what became the prevailing state law was that state courts could object to maps, but they could not order legislatures to reapportion. Uh, so the upshot of that sometimes was to leave in place what had been the previous map uh, before the one that, that was drawn. Also, the decisions of the state courts, it's quite remarkable, were often ignored by governors uh, and legislatures. Uh, and the same thing happened quite widely in response to the congressional laws that I mentioned before of 1842 and 1872. 
uh, states ignored those laws with impunity, um, including create, you know, it, right after the 1872 law, Michigan and Iowa both created congressional districts where uh, some districts had twice the population of others. Okay, this is right. Congress says it's got to be the same size. Michigan says, nah. Um, Congress in 1899, also finally dealing with this issue, which is just frothing ar around the country, appointed a special commission uh, on the problem of gerrymandering. Uh, and the conclusion of this special commission was that the congressional law saying that districts should be of the same size was simply an opinion of Congress and had no legal force. Um, they declared further that Congress had no role to play in objecting to a state's districting plan. And third, as a way of being reassuring to everyone, they said, well, since both parties are doing it nationally, it'll all come out in the wash anyway, so don't worry about it. Uh, so that was the courageous position taken by Congress at the end of the 19th century. The battles calmed down. I mean, really, the ferocious battles at the end of the 19th century, they calmed down in the 20th century, which one can think of the period from 1900 to about 1960 as the era of the silent or passive gerrymandering. Because um, basically, a couple of different things are happening. One is that large chunks of the country by 1905, 1910 are dominated by one political party. Right, the, south, the South is entirely Democratic. The Northeast is, is entirely Republican. There is less partisan conflict. Even a number of the Midwestern states um, settled down. State legislatures are dom going to be dominated by one party. There is less competition for state legislative seats and thus less need uh, to be districting and redistricting. And, the re and if, you, if you look at, the, it, at how frequent it, uh, what, so what happens after about 1910 is that uh, redistricting between censuses becomes quite rare rather than the norm. Okay, it really does uh, calm down. But what's going on, and this is why I was talking about as passive gerrymandering, what's going on is that, again, the, the, the demography of the country is changing dramatically. Um, and I mean, the, it, it, comes, uh, see this, it comes down in the South because they disenfranchise African Americans. And once they're disenfranchised, districting becomes less of an issue, and there's only the Democratic Party anyway. Uh, but elsewhere, what's, what's, go, what's going on is, uh, is basically that the, the, the structures of representation are remaining the same while the population is changing. And the, and the population set there, cities are growing, but it's counties that are, uh, that are, that are representative. Uh, you know, in New Mexico and in New Jersey, you get one representative per county. Um, in New York and, and, and Pennsylvania, there's a maximum number of representatives per county, but obviously the population shifts um, are enormous so that the number of people per representative is varying uh, dramatically. Uh, this issue is so bedeviling that in fact, Congress in, in 1920 can't even agree on how to reapportion congressional seats, which they're supposed to do after each census, but they could not agree. So in fact, there is no reapportionment of congressional seats among the states between 1910 and the early 1930s. Uh, many states uh, during this period developed districts that were two or three times the size of other districts. In Michigan, the ratio tended to be seven to one. Some districts were seven times as large in population. Um, and then, uh, you know, you know my, my favorite example is Cal the California State Senate in, in, in 1948, which actually, not, I think not coincidentally, was a, t a battle erupted in 1948 about this, but uh, the governor of California in 1948 was Earl Warren. So he had been through the gerrymandering and uh, apportionment wars as the governor of California long before they hit his desk uh, in the Supreme Court. But in the state senate of California in, uh, in 1948, um, the structure was still that you got one representative for, for each county, one, one senator per county. That included small counties that had 14 or 15,000 people and Los Angeles County, which had six million. And, they, and all of these got one state senator. Uh, 
By 1960, uh, by a very conservative set of estimates, 35% uh, of all congressional districts were seriously malapportioned, and the issue was much worse for most state legislatures. Right? So by, that's the situation. If that's the backdrop against which the Supreme Court finally acts in the 1960s. And in acting, it was reversing a decision, and most of you know, I'm sure, sure there are law students, uh, people experience it, they were reversing a, a precedent that had been established by the Supreme Court in 1946, um, in a, a case called Colgrove um, versus Green, where Justice Frankfurter had written that the court should not go into the quote, the famous phrase was the political thicket of districting, leave this to the political branches, we don't want to go near this. Um, that, was, that was an Illinois case about the Illinois le legislature and congressional districts where the ratio of largest to smallest district was nine to one and the Supreme Court deci decided that they had no business uh, going after this. What the court decided in the 1960s and, uh, was that it had to act because an undemocratic distribution of power could not be reformed democratically. Uh, in many ways, it's similar in its intellectual structure uh, to the decisions that the court also made and that the federal government made that it had to intervene in voting rights matters that had traditionally belonged to the states because the states would not uh, solve the problems, would not reform uh, by themselves. The first case that comes up on the Supreme Court, Baker versus Carr, originated in 1959. It gives you, again, this is an example of sort of passive gerrymandering. When Tennessee's cities filed a lawsuit against Tennessee's legislature, um, protesting that the legislature had refused to reapportion, which was true, and which had become something of a tradition. The Tennessee legislature had not reapportioned state legislative seats since 1901. Okay, this, this was in 1959. Uh, population to a distribution within Tennessee had changed substantially during that period, uh, but it had remained uh, the same. This is followed by a series of cases, and I'm just putting up some little excerpts um, from the decision. Um, a series of cases between 1962 and into the second half of the 1960s, um, invoking the Equal Protection Clause, among other rationales, um, that asserted first that the federal courts had jurisdiction uh, over districting, and then asserting that the one person, one vote had to be the standard for congressional elections and for both branches of state legislatures and for city council and other uh, elections. One of the f internal fights within the court and elsewhere was whether for state legislatures one person, one vote had to apply to both branches or whether it could apply to just one branch like the House of Representatives and then you could have another branch of the state legislature that, that was on some different basis. And the court decided, oh no, you, uh, uh, both branches uh, have to conform to one person, uh, one vote. Uh, now, something that I think is very important for us to understand, as a historian uh, speaking here, but also someone as we're dealing with contemporary problems. We have to understand that these decisions by the court were not simply accepted as good democratic common sense. Okay, I think we tend to respond to them now, oh yeah, they, you know, it was f fine. One, we, they, they finally got the one person, one vote. Of course they decided to do that. It was long overdue. I mean, everybody believes in one person, one vote. So uh, that's it. There was a huge negative, or huge I guess is the current word, um, ne neg negative counter reaction to these decisions. These were extraordinarily unpopular decisions. Um, Southern Democrats, rural politicians in many areas, many Republicans were up in arms for years about this. The, the Republican, the minority leader in the Senate, a man named Everett Dirksen, which some of us of a certain age, can, we, can, we, we can remember him, began a movement within Congress to try to pass a constitutional amendment uh, that would reverse uh, a number of these decisions and that would guarantee that one branch of each state legislature um, 
could be chosen on some basis other than population. They all, that this segued into a broader movement to, to call a constitutional convention uh, to overturn these and other democratic reforms um, of the 1960s. Getting rid of malapportionment getting, uh, was not popular everywhere. I mean, it's something we really have to understand you know, internalize. The struggle over the Supreme Court decision went on for years. Now, for us, I think we have to look at these cases in the 1960s uh, as, as a, you know, certainly as a kind of precedent of a court after a long period of abuses decides that it has to intervene to solve a problem that was corrosive to democracy and that could not be left to the political branches to solve. Uh, I'll finish up very, fairly quickly because we're, we're now moving into the, the more recent history. As, as, as we all know, the Supreme Court decisions of the 1960s got rid of a certain kind of malapportionment, but they did not completely solve the problem of gerrymandering. The problem did not end in 1966. Uh, they, again, you couldn't, you couldn't have districts of radically different sizes, but as political practitioners had long known, there are many different ways to skin a salamander. Um, and they could draw boundaries that could be used, for example, uh, with respect to race, they could, boundaries could be drawn that could discriminate based on race, actually, or eth ethnicity, um, or party. In terms of minority, in fact, in terms of minority rights, I think one way to see the, the history of this, in terms of minority rights and voting rights, the conflict over voting rights that had gone on and was extreme in the 50s and 60s, but had gone on for uh, a century, shifts in after 1970 into the 1970s from the ability of minorities to cast ballots, which obviously was the issue before the Voting Rights Act, to the weighting of a person's vote through districting. That becomes the racial issue uh, in, by the 1970s. And from the 1970s to the present, there has been co considerable conflict over, over racial gerrymandering about the distribution or maldistribution of minorities into districts which could enhance or diminish their ability to choose representatives um, of their own preference. Uh, the, it's, a, it's, it's a murky area of law. The, it, looked, it was a much disputed area of law in the 70s, 80s, and into the early 1990s. It seemed to settle down into an intellectually unsatisfying but politically manageable uh, equilibrium by about 2000, 2002, but I think the, the recent, the, the demise of the Voting Rights Act, I think, has stirred things up again so that racial gerrymandering cases um, are once again uh, becoming more widespread. But since there's a panel coming up to talk about that, um, I will leave that there. In terms of gerrymandering, uh, as you, political gerrymandering, um, as we all know it has not gone away. It has been ongoing and bipartisan. Uh, and so far, the Supreme Court has been unwilling to go far enough into the political thicket to deal with actual uh, political gerrymandering. But it is now, again, as everyone in this room knows, it's being obliged to do so. Um, and the case that is focused on is Gilby uh, versus Whitford, which we're going to hear something about later today. I think the new attention to gerrymandering, the to partisan gerrymandering, um, derives partly from a fierce Republican strategy um, in many states to gerrymander uh, for their own advantage, um, and partly from technological advances that have also been alluded to, which makes gerrymandering just much more efficient and effective than ever in the past. The overall conclusions about the history uh, and the relevance of the history, uh, I think the first thing is that the history makes clear that the impulse to gerrymander, to gain partisan advantage, will always be there in electoral systems that have single member districts. That impulse is not going to go away. People will try to gain uh, the system. That impulse will also become stronger in times of significant partisan conflict, like the present. Um, and it has also seemed the impulse to gerrymander also has seems historically to become more prevalent or more virulent when the electorate is being enlarged 
where it's changing shape, uh, it's acquiring new sort of ethnic, racial, um, religious composition. Other conclusion, although legislatures have sometimes, maybe fairly often, that we, we don't, they don't come to our attention when they're acting reasonably, they sometimes have acted quite reasonably, not pushing their advantage too far. Right? I mean, in part, in part, that's the commonly understood thing. You're not going to, you're not going to push too far, even if you have a majority, because you know that you might end up in the minority uh, a decade later, and then they might do it to you. Um, so, so, in some cases, you know, the legislatures act reasonably, but you can't count on their 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 willingness to do so. The Republicans in contemporary North Carolina who have displayed an extraordinary incapacity to behave uh, reasonably, did not invent the playbook they are using. They, you could find that playbook um, at any time in the 20th century or the late 19th century. Um, and finally, that the undemocratic consequences of gerrymandering can only be contained by active and vigilant courts, this would be the historical lesson, or by taking districting out of the hands of politicians, or both. It might, it, it, might, it might take both. But you cannot trust that politicians will not gerrymander. Um, and let, me, let me conclude here. I'm not gonna, oh, he gets a brief look. Um, I'm putting up there. I'm not, I'm not going to read it out, but I think it's, it's worth reading um, this quotation, which is filled with uh, moral indignation as Elmer Griffith is writing uh, about, uh, about this. It's a, I mean, including the, 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 the final line of this statement is one of the most unpatriotic, unpatriotic acts of legislation possible is a gerrymander. And what he's, what he's really objecting to here is that this is something which is illegitimate that is being done by lawmakers and that's inscribed in law. Uh, and that makes, it, that makes it particularly heinous. Um, Elmer Griffith was the first historian of gerrymandering in the United States. Uh, this book was actually his doctoral dissertation at the University of Chicago in, ni in 1907. And my f I guess my, my final incantation here is to express the hope that if it, maybe in 20 or 30 years, if another mid-21st century historian uh, of gerrymandering will be able, unlike Elmer Griffith, to use the past tense and not the present. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>